All right, guys, we have a brand new episode today that I'm so excited about. It's with Heather from We Sleep talking all about the importance of baby sleep and so much more. Talking about sleep, um, I did not get great sleep last night. It was busy. I was up pumping a couple of times and nursing my baby a couple of times. Um, so I'm going to show you what I do on the days that I don't get much sleep, but I still need to fuel through the day. I still need to get my stuff done and be productive and be a mom. So let's be real. Us moms are busy, productive. We got to push through sometimes. Okay. So I got my mom fuel Stanley. I got my mom fuel packet and we're just gonna mix it right in here like this. Now, normally I would do a whole thing with a spoon and stuff, but why do that when you've got a straw? We're just gonna mix it all up. And this is gonna be the perfect boost I need during my interview to give me that natural energy. I'm not gonna get jittery from coffee because it's a story for another time, but that's definitely happened during interviews where all of a sudden I get very jittery. I get very talkative. This gives me that nice, little boost of energy boost of fuel, fuel that I need to kind of just keep going um and those vitamins and minerals that are so 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 important to keep us going through the day so without further ado let's get into this interview Hi guys, thanks for joining us for another episode of Mom Talks. I'm so excited for this episode. We have Heather here from We Sleep. And we are talking all about baby sleep, education, support, and so much more. I know a lot of you moms out there have questions about it. I know I constantly have questions about baby sleep. So this is going to be a very vital episode for a lot of you guys. So without further ado, welcome Heather. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you guys about sleep and answer any questions you have. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I was saying, like, this is such a big topic. I know, like, it's probably one of the top things I see in our Facebook group, people asking about sleep, like, is this normal? How should I, you know, at different stages, how should you uh, approach sleep with babies? So just to get started, can you just tell us a little bit about you and then what you do? And then we'll kind of go into more details. Yeah. So I've been in the sleep space for 10 years now. Um, I started out nannying. I was a professional nanny for 10 years and um, I've worked with over 10 kids throughout that time to sleep train them. Um, just personally, like word got out in the community about um, how I was helping them and what I was doing. And a lot of moms wanted to work with me. Um, so I did start helping some moms and then I kind of got a little bit uncomfortable because I was like, you know, insurance and all these different things. And two years ago, I started looking into is sleep consulting a thing. And um, it actually was. I stumbled upon We Sleep, which is the company that I work for. And um, they're just beyond every other sleep consulting agency, I would say. Um, we have Charles Z, who has a PhD, and she's a child psychologist on our team. And we're constantly um, keeping up with the ever changing, you know, sleep space. It changes annually by the AAP. So. <laughs> Oh, amazing. I love that because yeah, I feel like things are constantly evolving and changing. So I feel like it's so good to like keep up to date with those things because research and stuff always changes. Hey, just kind of starting at the beginning, why is establishing healthy sleep habits so important for babies? Yeah. So infant sleep, it plays a huge role in cognitive and um, physical development. They need sleep to support all aspects of their physical health. And I think that um, a lot of moms are really confused on where to start. I feel like the infant sleep space is all over the place. There's so much information. There's so much misinformation. Um, and people have very strong opinions on different sleep methods. So I think it's such a personal thing too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things where uh, when you see like a post of it, it can go like, you know, one way or the other. And there's such mm -hmm. strong opinions because, you know, every baby is so different too, or it's like, this is what worked for me. This is what worked, didn't work for me. And I think we need to constantly, I mean, it goes with like anything with parenting. I feel like we need to constantly remind ourselves, other people that every baby is so different. Yeah. Um, so it necessarily worked for one doesn't, you know, work for the other. Mm -hmm. Um, so how does adequate, adequate sleep contribute to the overall wellness? I know we were kind of talking about cognitive functions, um, so how does that help with like babies and parents overall wellness? Yeah. So adequate sleep contributes drastically throughout their life. 
Um, it plays a huge role, like I said before, in cognitive and physical growth. They need sleep to support all aspects of their physical health. And it's even more important for new moms and dads. You need to be very careful with sleep deprivation. As I tell moms, um, it contributes to a ton of issues and it can compromise your ability to care for your child. So sleep wellness is super important for all aspects of your family, not only for your child, but I think especially for postpartum moms. I've definitely heard that a lot, that the sleep or lack of sleep can really affect your mental health. And like, sometimes we don't always realize it. Um, like I even tell some people now, like, I'm like, I think I kind of like blurred out a little, like, you know, like yes. in the beginning, like, I don't remember like the crazy lack of sleep, like luck, luckily knock on wood, she was a pretty good sleeper at the beginning. Um, and you know, we obviously had the form of regression that changed things, but as a newborn, I, she was pretty good, but I'm like, I remember some of the nights being really hard, but I think I just kind of mentally blocked some of them out. Cause it's like a coping thing. I think as like moms were just kind of like, it was fine. It was good. So what are some of the most like common sleep challenges you hear from parents? Um, especially like, um, I, with summer coming up, I was kind of thinking, you know, with, um, kind of talking more about like summer sleep. Cause I mean, I know schedules are kind of all over the place in the summer with yeah. you know, the older kids out of school, parents, maybe taking little breaks from work, whatever that looks like. So what are those common sleep challenges you see? Yeah. So, um, I think travel is a huge thing that we deal with in the summer. A lot of parents travel and I think that can really throw sleep in, you know, for a wind. It, it totally depends on what you're doing. We tell parents that we, we were, well, I work with a lot of parents who travel a lot. So they're traveling throughout the year, but especially in the summer months, they're doing really long trips like Europe and Asia and all these different places. Mm -hmm. And for people who do that, I really tell them to invest in some good travel gear. So there's a slumber pod. The slumber pod goes over the pack and play and it blacks it out. Mm -hmm. Having a travel sound machine. Um, I would say stick with the same kind of sleep sack that you're using at home. You want to make their space as consistent as possible, especially when you're traveling. That's going to help you avoid a lot of these sleep issues. And I know that in turn, a lot of children sleep better in the summer because they're doing all these activities. They're getting the sunlight and the sunlight is like one of the most important things for sleep. But um, yeah, I would say with traveling, it's that's the biggest issue I see in the summer. And I think a lot of parents who do end up traveling and doing these things they don't plan for it adequately. And then when they go away, they come back with all these different issues, or maybe they've had a sleep trained child and they go away and they come back and now everything's all messed up. So I think just planning ahead, investing in some good travel gear and, um, you know, keeping your, your routine as consistent as possible as when you're away at, you know, at the same time as when you're home. Yeah. You brought up a really good point about travel and stuff. And, um, this is kind of off the cuff, so don't yeah. really have to answer this, but um, we're planning our first trip and my daughter just turned a year old and um, like, she's never been on a plane before and it's going to be an eight hour plane ride and we're going international. And so when it comes to doing something like international, cause I know like, you know, for adults, they're like, if you fly international, like keep your day going, mm -hmm. how does that necessarily work with keeping your child on a sleep schedule, like having them nap on the go, or I know that happens a lot of times, like traveling. So like, what would be your tips for longer plane rides or like sleeping kind of like on the go? Yeah. So like I said, it, it would be the same thing as, you know, investing in some good travel gear. So, um, it's 2024, we have amazing things out there. I would say one of the biggest things with the plane, especially with your child's age. So children, um, who are two years old can no longer sit with you on the plane. So you can still get away with it, but I always tell parents, if you can afford it buy your child, that seat, um, it gives you a break, especially when you're flying eight hours is a long time to have a baby on your lap and switch between you and your husband, or if you have a nanny or caretaker or whatever, it's still a lot. And I like to tell parents, if you have a child under two, um, there's two things you can do. So the first thing I always say is bring your car seat. Um, it keeps them in place. It's, it's a place that they're also used to sleeping in. And the plane also sounds like a sound machine. So a lot of the times sleeping is generally okay on a plane. Um, so yeah, I would say bring your car seat if you can. If you don't want to go down that route, they also have these blow up kind of, they're called toddler beds, but they fit in that space where their feet would like hang down. So it kind of gives them a whole, you know, area to sleep in. It blows up really quickly. 
Um, and I think that's like on the floor of the plane. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it, it connects from the seat and it goes down to the floor. So it totally fills that space and it becomes like an inflatable bed for them. Mm-hmm. And I think um, that's so important for those long haul flights, because like I said, like having a child on your lap for eight hours, it sounds like you can do it and you can push through it. But I like to tell parents like this is a vacation. This is a time for you. And it's almost going to be like you're working for eight hours. Like it is not easy to keep a one-year-old entertained on a plane for an hour. It's, it's impossible. So um, I can even share with you, I have lists on Amazon of like fun toys that stick to the window. And like, that's what I would really say to do it. Um, bring a lot of toys that they have never seen um, snacks. So this is not the time to be healthy. You want to give them anything and everything you can to just keep them quiet for an hour um, if your child is one years old, so your child's still on the spectrum where they're still taking a bottle. Um, so I would definitely say during takeoff, I would give them a bottle. If you're nursing, I would nurse them. Um, if you're past that stage and your child is around two years old, I'd give them something to suck on. So, um, you don't necessarily have to go with like a lollipop. They make healthier ones, but it really helps with that pressure in their ears. And mm-hmm. then if you're not super comfortable with giving them, you know, candy or anything to suck on, I tell parents to bring a straw, a straw cup with something that, you know, your child will love. So like, get a milkshake in the airport, you know, get chocolate milk, get something that they're going to drink it all in one sip and then give that to them as you're taking off. Mm, I love that. Yeah. It's funny because, um, I was planning on like starting to like wean like with breastfeeding yeah. and I was like, I want to be able to breastfeed her on the plane because <laughs> I've heard about that. And it's, it's down the road. It's like, we're five months away from this trip. Yeah. So she'll be more closer to a year and a half by that point. But it's so funny. You said that too, about like getting an extra seat. Cause when we bought the tickets, we just bought them for my husband and I, yeah. and I was like, she'll sit on my lap. And then we literally this morning, we're like, I think we should buy an extra seat and maybe bring her car seat. Cause we're like, <laughs> and she can be like harnessed and like, yeah. safe. And, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that's a whole other just discussion for another time, I guess, but yeah, you travel so, in the future. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Like all these things we got to think about and, mm-hmm. and kind of going on to that, like talking about like consistent sleep, cause mm-hmm. that's when travel obviously is going to like throw that off. So like, what's the, what's the benefit of consistent sleep while at home? And then, you know, when it turns into summer, summer, maybe you're doing more activities during the day oh. or traveling. Um, how can you help keep those schedules as consistent as possible. Um, And what kind of tips would you offer parents kind of struggling with that? Yeah. So everything you're doing at home, I would recommend you do, you know, while you're out. I know a lot of parents during sleep training, they do stay home and they kind of like hunker down for a few days. But once you're through that sleep training thing, your child can definitely sleep on the go. So um, I do like to tell parents every now and then it's good to have, you know, a, a car seat nap or a stroller nap. I know that there's a brand called Cozy Go and it blacks out your stroller. So it's like a blackout cover for your stroller, the slumber pod, all these things I would use to your advantage while you're traveling, because they're going to make your child's space as consistent as possible with the time change. Um, I'm assuming if you're traveling to eight hours, you're going to have a little bit of a time change. There's two things we can, with you that you can do with that as well. So the first thing you can do is nothing. Um, you just take your child through, you keep them on the schedule that you're on. You know, it doesn't always work when you're traveling, you know, super long hours, but um, getting them to nap on the plane. And then once you're there, kind of trying to keep them awake for at least an hour longer. And then every single day, kind of increasing it by an hour. Um, that is a little bit more tricky and there are things that go along with that. But I would say that when you're home, um, the week before or so I would start pushing their naps an hour towards the schedule that you're going to be when you're traveling. Um, and this way it kind of just gives them a little bit of a boost, um, while you're away and it, it keeps that consistency for them. So, especially with your baby's age, when they're one years old, um, it's, it's not a good idea to just kind of do things cold Turkey. Um, they're now in this toddler stage where they're pushing boundaries and, you know, they're independent and all these things are happening and it can be really difficult to be consistent while you're away. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think that, um, there's an exact method to go with. I think that when you're traveling, you just kind of have to go with the flow. Sometimes, um, your child is going to break down. They are going to have tantrums. They are going to be overtired. But I think the memories are more important than that. And I think that um, everything that you're doing at home, try to bring with you, try to plan, try to keep everything as consistent as possible. This way, when it is time for them to go down or when they are going to sleep, they're in more of a consistent area. And I think, as you know, like consistency is the most important thing for sleep training. So yeah, I would just say, keep it, you know, as the same as it is as home as when you're traveling. And hopefully you shouldn't really have any problems if you do run into problems. There's only so much you can do while you're away. Um, I think that 
you know, keeping your child happy and healthy and fed is the most important thing. And just realize before you go, like there are, it, it could all go beautifully, you know, it can be amazing and the best trip ever. But I think that, you know, plan for the worst and expect the worst. And then just when there, if something comes, that's great. And they're taking naps, just, you know, take that as a win. Yeah. Being as realistic as possible. I think yes. is a good, yeah. I'm like, we're going to expect all these tantrums. It'll be okay. And if yeah. it goes great, then we'll be like, wow, that was awesome. Let's do it again. Yeah. um what are some of the biggest misconceptions you hear when it comes to sleep training um and baby sleep out there oh wow there are so many (laughs) I think um it it totally depends on who you're speaking to I think co-sleeping is one of the biggest you know misconceptions that go around in the sleep world right now I know there are some diehard you know crunchy mom co-sleepers But as a sleep consultant, I think that following the AAP guidelines is one of the most important things for your baby's life. I think that co-sleeping in turn can sometimes be easier for the mom. And I know that a lot of people say it has benefits and X, Y, and Z, but um, what you're really doing is posing a huge risk to your child's life. And it's just something that you can't get around and you can't do safely. And there's just, there's no um, research or studies out there that show that it is safe. I know that parents even who put like little um, bassinets in the middle of their bed. You have to be really careful with those, especially if your child's rolling. Um, You don't know if their face goes up to the mesh. A lot of the times with SIDS, what happens is carbon monoxide poisoning. Mm -hmm. So um, you just have to be, you have to be really careful with that. But I think there are so many myths out there. Yeah. I know when um, my daughter was first born, you know, you, you, when you talk to people, they try to, you know, give you different advice when it comes to sleeping. And that was one of the things that, multiple people kept telling us was like oh just use your because we had the um daca tot they're like oh just use that in a bassinet or put it in your bed and my husband and I are like we are just not comfortable with that and even like there was one night we had it in the bassinet and I didn't sleep at all that night because I was like I don't feel good about it so we took it out and I think we stopped using it because I started seeing all the research about the daca tot and how they can you know rebreathe and I was like yeah I I just don't feel comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary because there's so many, I feel like, especially with the internet now, you can find anything to support what you want to say. So sure. it's easy for people to be like, oh, can I use this, the DACA tot? And then you're going to find a, a blog that's like, yeah, we used it, you know? Yeah. So I think it's so important to really, you know, do your research. Yeah. Um, and I always tell parents, be careful with all these breathing monitors that are coming out and all these different things. Um, something a lot of moms don't know, but if you previously have had a child that has passed away from sudden infant death syndrome, the hospital will provide you a hospital grade um, breathing monitor. So mm-hmm. it doesn't hook up to your phone. It makes an extremely loud noise when your child stops breathing and it happens the second, you know, it does it. You don't get to keep the monitor. You do have to give it back towards the end. But I know that the, the is it the AAP or something just approved the Owlet, mm-hmm. which um, they're there's so much, like I said, there's so much that goes on with these breathing monitors. You really have to be careful with them. They give parents a lot of false positives and a lot of parents rely on them to unsafe sleep. So a lot of parents will use the Owlet or will use the Nanit or do all these different things or the Stoke um, to co-sleep. So that's what I tell parents. This is not like a backup type of thing where if your child stops breathing for a second, you know, this is going to wake you up and remind you and all these different things. Sometimes you, because it's on your phone, sometimes if your phone's on do not disturb, or if these different things happen, the the notification isn't even going to come through. And most of the time, by the time it does come through, it's already too late. Mm. So I just like to tell parents, be really careful with these breathing monitors. They're not a safe way to co-sleep and they're not safe to use while co-sleeping. Um, I more so would say if you have a child that is premature or you know, does have breathing issues that you can, that you reach out to your hospital and get a hospital grade breathing monitor, mm-hmm. um, the breathing monitors out there right now, they're doing great things. And I think that in 10 years, they're going to be, you know, a very vital tool, but I don't think that they're up to par where they're going to save your child's life every single time. So just be super careful with them. Yeah. It's, um, what I just hear about, like, it's almost like those, um, what are they, the CPR, like the life back thing? Yeah, I've heard the life back. They're, they're okay to have, but I've heard a lot of doctors talk about them saying like, it gives you a false sense of security. Yes. So I that kind of is that same thing. So it's like, well, I don't have to worry about it because I have this to depend on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think too, it's about like knowing yourself too. Cause I remember people were telling me about the outlet and I was like, I feel like that would almost cause more anxiety for me because I would be like, cause I've heard like then every little ding goes off or like, you yes. know, oh, 
you just need to like jump out of your sleep, like, okay, what's wrong? And then it's like, is anything wrong? Why did this go off? And so, yeah, I think there's so, and I don't know, it's like, there's so many different, like new things that can come up from it. So yeah, definitely. Um, so how can parents differentiate between normal sleep patterns and then signs of problems in their babies? So sleep consulting doesn't um, necessarily diagnose any sleep issues. Let's say there's like insomnia or sleep apnea or anything else in play. Um, the differential would be if the issues persist even after sleep training. So we do health analysis, um, health, sorry, health assessments um, when people, you know, go in for their consultation. And these are things that we really look at. So um, usually when they are coming in, children are a little bit older. They're usually coming in around like the seventh, seven months, eight months. We have a little bit of newborns in four months sleep regression, but usually parents kind of are still trying to work things out. Usually by seven months, if nothing's working, that's when they really start losing their mind. So mm -hmm. I would just say if you are looking, um, or I would say if you notice any, you know, health issues that might be going on with your child, I wouldn't reach out to a sleep consultant. I would go directly to your doctor and during your consultation with your sleep consultant, most of them do um, health analysis. So I think that would be picked up pretty quickly. Okay. I mean, send you straight to your doctor. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it definitely is smart. Yeah. Cause it, it's so hard, like, especially in the beginning when you're kind of like learning your baby and, yeah. and it's like, you'll like be like, Oh, like I remember at eight weeks, my daughter was sleeping like through the night for a newborn. So I think that was like, what do they say? Like six plus hours or something. Yeah. And all my friends were like, oh my gosh, what that never happened. And then I was like, yeah, that's so cool. And then literally like three months, I think it was like that maybe lasted for a month. And then at three months, it was like early four month regression. So babies are just always changing. So I'm like, so we were like, okay, like, do we need sleep help? Like, is she in a yeah. new phase? It's so hard to always to know. Yeah, for sure. I think that if it persists longer and you're losing your mind, and I think that one of the biggest things for sleep consulting is there's so much misinformation out there, as we previously talked about, and there is just so much information in general. I think that it almost, parent moms are losing their sense of they know what's best. And I think that that's something that I preach to my clients very heavily is if you're seeing something different or if something's off, you're usually right. And I think that with all this information and all these things out there, moms are losing that connection to their instincts that are one of the most important things for parenting. And they're losing their confidence in themselves as a mom. And that's one of the biggest things in um, my you know, business is just establishing that confidence back, giving them all the tools they need to know that they're doing the right thing. You know, They have that person behind them that's pushing them um, throughout the whole progress and is holding their hand throughout the whole entire situation. And um, it's so funny. Like I, I, when I start with moms, they're like, they're, they're crying and there's a baby screaming in the background. And then like at the end of our call and our times together, they're crying, like thanking me up and down for like saving their lives. And it's just like, they have everything from the beginning. You know, I think that this day and age, we train moms to think that they don't know what's best and they don't know what they're doing. And I think that you, every single mom knows what's the best thing for their child. Nobody knows their child like you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's sad that we're kind of going in that direction, but I hope that, you know, with times changing and like more moms getting supported and all these different things that moms really start gaining, you know, their confidence back in being a mother and knowing what's best. Yeah. That's such a good point. I was just talking to someone, I think in another interview, we were talking about how like it can almost be more damaging to like all these things and like the internet, mm -hmm. cause it's like so overwhelming. And, um, like, I think the internet's a great place to connect and like, you know, educate ourselves and learn more. But on the other side of it, it's like, for every, like I was just talking about, like there for every um, question you have, there's going to be like 12 different opinions. I mean, hundreds of opinions sometimes. And so like, you know, even when I'm like finding myself Googling, I'm like, oh, this says this, but then I'm like, wait, but this one says this and this one says this. So it can be so overwhelming to just be like, do I not know what's best? Yeah. So kind of like, we have to like teach ourselves to kind of like separate ourselves. Like I always tell people in our Facebook group, like before you go to the Facebook group for a question, like what feels right for you and then have a basis of what makes sense. Then you can go and be like, okay, more people were kind of saying this. Cause if you go in like having no, I don't know, no idea of where you want to go. You're so easily going to be like, just like sway yeah. every way. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of um, talking about how we can like approach sleep training with babies. Mm -hmm. What are some key things that you look at and consider when parents come to you at, for, for the first time? 
Yeah. So for WeSleep, um, a lot of the sleep consulting agencies out there, they use kind of like a one size fits all plan or some of them get too big and you just can't physically meet with each person. So WeSleep uses 100% customizable sleep plans and it's tailored to your family. So that's where we're going to find the most consistency is what you can do consistently. So we play off of that. I would also say if you're ready, you know, research the consultant that you're going to use. I think that Sadly, there's no regulations right now on sleep consultants, and it's a really dangerous thing. Yep. I've seen so many sleep consultants um, recommend dangerous items. So things like weighted sleep sacks for, you know, younger kids and like some of them do recommend co-sleeping and you really, really, really need to be careful with who you're choosing. So we sleep is working directly to become the first sleep consulting agency to be accredited by university. We're hoping at the end of this month, we're going to do that and accomplish that. But um, that's why we hired Charles Z, who's our child's, um, you know, sleep psychologist, because I think that too, like we said before, it's just an ever-changing annual type of thing and you need to keep up with that. So um, yeah, I would say if you're considering sleep training, the biggest thing you need to look into is who are you choosing? What mm -hmm. is their background? You know, what type of people do they have on your team? A lot of them are, you know, one woman shows and they kind of take this like six week course and then there's no, you know, after training. And um, with We Sleep, we constantly have to every single year keep up with our training and keep up with, you know, studying and do all these different things. So I think that, um, yeah, we take sleep science very seriously. So just finding a sleep consultant that does that as well. Yeah, that's such a great point, too, with um, with the Internet, where anyone can claim themselves as an expert on something. Yes. And, um, I see it all the time. And then people will be like, this person has actually no credentials in this. They're just kind of saying it. And so, yeah, you make a great point, like definitely like research with something that's so important as baby sleep and anything to do with babies should be like, let's make sure we've got background and credentials in that. Um, so that's, that's really exciting for We Sleep to be able to have um, so many different professionals looking at different areas for babies um, and their health. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are some, um, specific, I know we kind of talked a little bit about having those, you know, different, there's different products out there, there like for sleeping, like on the go. Um, but what are some different like strategies or techniques for, to help babies sleeping over the summer, through the summer? I would definitely say a lot of things that play into this have to do with older children, um, a lot of parents do have children home and it does disrupt, you know, the sleep patterns. I think that overall sleep is a little bit easier in the summer. Like I said before, they're really getting the vitamin D. They're really tiring themselves out being in fresh air. Um, and I think that, um, like I said before, just planning ahead, kind of getting all your older children's stuff in one place, seeing where, you know, your schedule would work out with your baby during the summer and trying to kind of sticking to one plan and not going back and forth. So let's say like your child has an activity during your baby's nap time. I would maybe let your baby wake your baby up earlier or let them sleep a little bit later to push their nap times back in the summer. Um, and yeah, just do your best as, as much as you can, especially with like older children, they have sports and they have games and they have swimming and summer camp and all these different things. Um, if your baby has to sleep in the car seat for a nap, like that is totally fine. Um, we, I just tell parents, do your best. There's only so much you can do in the summer. And especially when you have older children home, you can only keep them as quiet as you can for so long. So um, if you can with your children, if you do have children home while your child is sleeping, I would definitely kind of sit them down before summer happens and maybe incorporate like a quiet hour, a quiet time where, you know, they have their iPads or they're outside or they're doing a craft or something with mom, um, just to be able to keep your younger children on schedule in the summer. Cause I know that that's a huge thing that affects, um, sleep is having the older kids home and they're loud and they're running around and they're playing mm -hmm. and mom is more stressed out having all these kids home and trying to work and trying to get our kids to sleep. So. Um, yeah, I'm sure that's like such a big thing. I'm like, right now I just have the one. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like when she's quiet, I'm like, we're, you know, so I can only imagine like, yeah, older kids running in or, you know, being home from school, wanting to go do something. I'm sure that's yeah. a big adjustment. And they uh, need a lot of mom's attention in the summer as well. Whereas like the baby needs so much attention too. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm sure it's like a whole new kind of like training process or um, schedule process, I guess. Um, so we talked about this in the beginning, but kind of diving into a little bit deeper, how does um, baby sleep, like adequate sleep impact baby's physical and cognitive development? 
Yeah. So I think one of the most important things to talk about is REM sleep. So REM sleep is super important for cognitive development and non-REM sleep is also important for a lot of physical development. So restoration, immunity, um, it isn't so black and white as I'm saying it here, but it's important for everyone to get a full night's sleep since different types of sleep happen um, more throughout the night, right? So more non-REM early in the night, and then a lot of REM happens through the second half of the night. And all of this is true, especially after the four-month sleep regression, once baby sleep cycles are mature like ours. So they go from two sleep cycles to four sleep cycles. And um, anecdotally, I've also seen developmentally delayed kids start walking, talking, all these other physical developments once they start getting quality sleep. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a super interesting thing that um, a lot of parents don't know is like, sleep is one of the biggest factors in your child's life. And it really disrupts everything if they're not getting adequate sleep. That makes such good sense. Like, it's like something we wouldn't think about. But when you say it like that, I'm like, oh, like, yeah, like, that's like their time to like grow and their brain to develop. And yeah, um, yeah that that's so interesting. And I find it too, like, when I don't know, like I noticed like my daughter's sleep patterns just kind of changed. Like maybe she's sleeping extra or she's refusing naps. I do notice like different things going on. Like I feel like when she sleeps extra, I'm like, oh, I think she's going through a growth spurt or, yeah. you know, or she'll be more like fussy. And I'm like, oh, I think like maybe she's teething. And so like, I feel like it all definitely plays in line with uh, sleep, which is so interesting. So can you share some different tips that parents can like listening can go away with and, um, that can help their baby kind of promote or help help promote healthy sleep in their home with their babies and then also pri- prioritizing their own self-care like while they do it. Yeah, so I think even sleep training your baby is definitely prioritizing your own self-care. Um I think that it's really important um to just make sure they're sleeping adequately. I know that a lot of, you know, wellness stuff goes into this as well. And really, if your baby isn't sleeping, it's so hard for parents to do anything, especially self-care. It's it's almost impossible for parents to take care of themselves within the first year of life. So I think that being super consistent um, just in your day-to-day life is important for your wellness. So let's say your baby's going to sleep at two and you have like two hours and the house is a mess and there are dishes everywhere and like whatever. I tell parents, leave all of that. Like the house is going to be a mess as soon as you clean it in five minutes anyway. Take that time to just sit with yourself, you know, work out, go for, maybe don't go for a walk if your child's sleeping. Mm -hmm. But if you have a husband or nanny home, like take that time, go for a walk, do something for yourself, go grab a coffee. Um, You, I think that your identity is so lost in that first year and it's so hard to get it back. And I think there are so many um, times where you don't even have the time to do anything for yourself, Never mind like self-care. So I think that, just prioritizing your baby's sleep gives you extra time to, you know, work on your own wellness, your own self-care and just staying consistent with your baby too. So you can also stay consistent in your, you know, self-care journey. Yeah, absolutely. It's like how we're just talking about how baby, how sleep for baby affects them so much in their growth and development. Um, And on the other end, if they're getting better sleep, we can get better sleep and we can, you know, take care of ourselves and feel better. um, And I think definitely like nights that like I was up a lot because baby was up a lot. I'm not functioning as great, you know, so it definitely all, all ties together. Um, and this kind of ties into it, but like, what role does good sleep play with supporting mental health of both parents and babies? Yeah. So I want to touch really quick on USA laws about this. So, um, sleep plays the biggest role in mental health. I'm super passionate about the mental health of mothers. I think that postpartum moms need more care and more time with their kids. USA laws are like completely out of control. Some moms that I work with only receive six months off. Maybe they're working on Wall Street or they own a business or whatever. Like you just don't have the time. And sometimes you're still bleeding after six weeks and you're expected to like go back to work and leave your baby. And I think working moms are one of our biggest customers, but we do anything and everything to try to get them back on track before they have to go to work. But I think this is such a big topic in the USA right now because our mental health department is absolutely a disaster. And I think that the the people we pay the least attention to is postpartum moms, which is crazy. Like I saw a video the other day of like a guy getting a vasectomy and he had to like not lift things for two weeks and like take, you know, narcotics or whatever. And like a mom pushes the baby out. She's sent home in two days and she has to take care of this baby 24 hours a day. Like I think that how could parents in the U.S. not have all these mental health issues? I think that it's such a broader issue than just, you know, working on mental health. I think that um, moms in America really 
well, not that they're not doing enough, but I think that the USA laws really need to come together and, you know, start giving moms the things that they need. I know that like in Europe, you can get up to like 12 months off. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just, it's insane what people have to do. And no wonder all these moms are dealing with all this postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression and mental health. And then you have practitioners who are just immediately putting them on like SSRIs, which is anxiety medication. And then you have to get off of those and just like all these different things. I think that in America, we look for this like super quick fix and just trying to get them back to work as quickly as possible. And I think that's one of the biggest, um, you know, issues that's going on in the mom, you know, postpartum wellness space right now. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours about how mental health and the maternity leave in the U S is like awful because, um, we post about it a lot of times here and just to kind of like get um, perspective from other moms too. And like, just kind of be like, what do you, what'd you guys get off? And like, I've seen as little as like three or four weeks from people, from people. And I'm like, you're not even done healing at that point. Yeah. Um, and it's really, I think you make a really good point about, I think how um, sleep, mental health, uh, maternity leave, all kind of works together. Cause we're like, if I can't sleep, then I can't work. And if I have to go back to my job and I don't have, you know, there's all this like stress that's put on mom. And then it's like a vicious cycle, like you said, cause yeah, like feeling a certain way because they're not getting sleep, they're not able to work or take care of their baby. Um, and yeah, it's really sad that mom's postpartum aren't supported more, um, oh, no. at a federal level. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. So I live in New Jersey. I know that New Jersey now has, I think, three months paid family leave. I know that, you know, it is becoming a bigger thing with other states and that there's some laws being passed in the next couple of years. But um, my sister-in-law is pregnant and she has three months off and she is wondering to herself, how is she going to go back to work with having a three month old? And I think that every single mom struggles with this. And I think that if there were more resources and more time off for parents, they wouldn't be so stressed out those first couple of weeks to get their baby on track so quickly. They would have more time for bonding. And I think that sleep training and bonding go so hand in hand. A lot of moms, especially when they first have the baby, if they've been working, they don't feel, they don't feel the instant bond with their child. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you throw sleep deprivation in it and then anxiety and postpartum depression, you don't even know who your child is. And I've dealt with this a lot with parents. And I think that once these things start changing, the mental health wellness, and I just think the entirety of the postpartum, you know, department is just going to get better and better the more that we help them out. And I think that back then, 40 years ago, there were all, you know, you had people next door and you had your family that came over and you had this whole village. And now like, we're all so tied to online and parents work from home and, you know, families are dispersed all over the country that people have absolutely nothing. And it is, there's nothing harder than trying to raise a child with just you and your husband. It's impossible. It does mm -hmm. take a village. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I was just um, talking in a podcast episode episode about how like um, with my, like I was talking about like my breastfeeding journey postpartum and I feel like the support because I had great support like in the hospital and then my husband was able to take paternity leave. That was really helpful. And we have some family nearby and I'm like, yeah. we got really lucky, but a lot of people don't have that. And then also with my maternity leave, like I had really great maternity leave and it was flexible. Plus I'm at home. So I'm like here for yeah. the time. <laughs> I'm here. If I want to go take a walk with her, like it's really great. And I can go into it, but like my husband has a nice schedule where he's home a lot of times during the day too. Yeah. And so that helps so much to be able to be like, okay, it's not fully on me at all times, mm -hmm. or I can get a little bit of a break. I can still get work done. Not to say I wasn't a little like nervous going back yeah. too, because it was like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to work having a baby? And at that time too, they're cluster feeding. So there's so much. Um, so I feel like there's definitely needs to be more resources with helping moms when it comes to um, that whole postpartum phase, which is, you know, different for everybody, how much support they need, but offering the, that kind of support is so, so helpful. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what other, um, when it comes to, and I know we could like talk about that forever, but um, what other tools and resources do you recommend to moms um, or parents in general who want to learn more about promoting healthy sleep for babies? 
Yeah. So like I said, I would definitely recommend looking into what there's so many different sleep training methods or so many different, so there's no one size fits all. I think that parents have to think about what's important to them. So I know that a lot of parents go to their doctor and the doctor recommends like Ferber method to help them. And we don't use the Ferber method. We don't advocate for it, which is the cry out method. So I think um, figuring out what's, what step you want to take, if you're ready to sleep train, if you want your child sleeping through the night, if the two wakes, wake ups at night don't necessarily bother you, you don't necessarily have to sleep train. So I would say that if you're looking for resources, um, I would even go to We Sleep's page and, you know, look through everything that they have to offer as well. So we have, you know, multiple experts and we have newborn experts and four month sleep regression experts and all these different things that you can use. Um, but I think that the biggest tool you should do if you're looking into sleep training and you want to improve that area of your life is start researching a sleep consultant and get in touch with one. Um, like I said, it's not regulated. So every single sleep consultant does such different things. So you do need to be careful, but um, it, it really does depend on the parent, what they want, how they want to go about it, um, what things that they're comfortable with, what things are they uncomfortable with. And um, yeah, I, I would start there okay. just thinking about it and thinking about what you know you want out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you say kind of like do your own kind of evaluation of like, what are your goals with sleep or what do you need with sleep? Cause I remember like hearing like when I think I was still pregnant people were like, Oh, you're going to for sure sleep train at four months. Right. And I was like, I, I mean, I don't know. My daughter's not even here or my baby's not even here. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> um, and you know, I would kind of, or I would mention to friends like, Oh yeah, she still wakes up a few times. And like, it was like, Oh, they're not sleeping through the night yet. And I was like, are they supposed to be? And like, cause it never bothered me. Like, you know, if, oh, she wakes up two, like right now she wakes up like one time a night. So I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. So I think you make a good point about like also asking yourself like, okay, what if they're waking up like six times, like, okay, maybe it's time to like, see, mm -hmm. you know, ask yourself what kind of, what does a good sleep look like for you? Um, and, uh, instead of comparing yourself, I think we always do that too. We're like, oh, their baby slept through the night right away. Like, what should I, you know, should my baby be doing that? So um, that's a great point. Um, so just tell us a little bit more about We Sleep. Where can people connect with you at We Sleep? Um, and um, yeah, all that good stuff about, you know, if people want to learn, learn more. Yeah. So the good thing about We Sleep is we've been open since 2011. So we have seen the sleep space change drastically over the years. Um, I think that we are one of the largest international companies, um, you know, worldwide. We closely follow AAP regulations, sleep science. This is why we hired, you know, a child psychologist with a PhD to help us keep up with the, you know, the annually changing um, sleep reg regulations. And like I said before, we are a team of about 30 sleep consultants. Um, there is always training afterwards. So we do have to go to training like almost every single week. Um, there are so many topics that come up that we, you know, discuss. So vomiting and sleep training. And, you know, maybe parents aren't ready for sleep training and all these different things and all these different topics we cover. Um, and I think that you're getting so much more when you're going to a sleep consulting agency, because a lot of these times, like I said before, when they're like these one woman shows, they're not keeping up with regulations. They're kind of just getting their sleep certification. They start their business and they kind of go from there. But I think with um, sleep science and especially with pediatricians, this is actually something that a lot of people don't know is pediatricians don't do a ton of sleep studies while they're in school. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them have no idea about sleep training. So if you are a sleep consultant, I highly recommend working closely with a doctor. Um, it gives you accreditation. You're keeping up with AAP guidelines with them, but you're also helping them out as well. So um, we also, like I think I said before, we have like um, experts on our team. So we have a twin mom who's a multiples expert. Um, I work in the four month sleep regression and newborn expert space. Um, we have so many consultants who are different experts in the field who have dealt with things. So like if you're moving or if you're making like a huge move across the country, like we've had a consultant who has done that before. So we have so much experience within our community and our company that this is exactly why I chose this company to go with. Yeah. I love that because as we talked about earlier, there's so many different stages and yeah. so many individual needs between babies and parents. So the fact that your agency has someone in each kind of area specifically catering to those needs, I think is so important because like you said, some of the companies out here where we don't know the full creden credentials, you know, um, they might just have like an umbrella of sleep yes, training, it might exactly, not be yeah. kind of <laughs> focused in. And so I think it's hard to know, but definitely need to do your research out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, amazing. And so um, 
Where can everyone find more about We Sleep? Is there a social media page to follow, website, all that good stuff? Yeah, so our website is www.wee, like dash sleep.com. Um, we have tons of resources in there. We have newsletters, we have blogs in the past that we've done. Um, if you go to consultants, you can find me under Heather Allen. Um, I also do our company's marketing, so I work a lot with that. Um, but yeah, there's also, yes, we do have an Instagram and it's just we underscore sleep. And then um, each consultant is, you know, Heather underscore we sleep. So if you have a consultant that you worked with in the past, let's say we have one named Cecilia, it would be we sleep underscore Cecilia. So all of our consultants are monitored on Instagram, um, just making sure that nobody's posting, you know, outside of AAP guidelines. Everybody's pretty aware of it though, but it just kind of keeps us all together within a company so that people, you know, can find us a little bit easier. Amazing. I love that. And then of course, I always like to end these interviews with, I call it like a fun thinking question. If you could have one billboard made today, or you could share one tip with moms everywhere, what would you have it say? Yeah. So I, I think I would do two things. The first thing I would do is talk about consistency. I think that it's the most important aspect of sleep training. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're not consistent with it, um, it's not going to stick. But the other thing that I know that we touched on about, and this is like what I'm most passionate about is I would say you're doing the right thing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. Your mama instinct is correct. And you are always correct in that area. Um, and I think that you're doing everything correct for your baby. Like, I, like we talked about, so many moms are detached from their like maternal instincts and they're terrified of messing up. And I think we need to take that out of the equation. There is no messing up. Um, there's mistakes that can be made, but you're not ruining your child. You're not ruining your bonds and nothing you're going to do is going to affect your child long-term, you know, physically. Mm -hmm. um, and I just can't wait for a world where more moms feel confident in, you know, their mothering skills. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I feel like so many moms need to hear that because like I know first and foremost when I'm like doubting myself it's usually because I've been hearing like so many other opinions yeah and the ironic thing is like when my I did so much re like research and through the, like interviews and working for these companies that when I was pregnant I knew exactly what I didn't want to do with birth and labor I knew yes. I wanted to do with, with breastfeeding but then when it came to other things or like as she gets older like for like eating all that stuff I was like well, let me just Google this. Let me go on the group. Let me do this. And then yeah. it's like, it's so overwhelming. So definitely trusting gut. And then if you're not doing like what everybody else in your mom group is doing, you're getting mom shamed. And I think that's a huge thing that not everybody needs to be doing the exact same thing. And no one size fits all for each child. That's why we do custom sleep plans. So it's, everything's not going to work for your child. And I think that um, moms know best. They know their child. I can't tell you how many times, like I've jumped on a call with moms and they tell me something. And I'm just like, that's because you know best. I'm like, you know better than I do. You know your child better than I do. And I think it's just something that I fight so wholeheartedly for is just giving moms that confidence back because I think that's just what everybody's lacking right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, same thing. We'll see someone post in the group like a like a long paragraph and a question and we'll be like, you know, it's like from what you just yeah. said, you know, it's best. I think you just wanted other people to kind of be like, you got this validation. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Like having that, that community around you for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Like I, I learned so much. I'm definitely going to be taking some of this to yeah. when we go travel and, you know, all that craziness of summer sleep, but thank you so much for coming on. It was awesome talking with you. Um, everyone go check out. We sleep. Yes. <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions. I would love to help you guys. All right, guys, that was my interview with Heather from We Sleep. I know I learned a lot from that. As I said, we are planning a trip coming up with my daughter. And so a lot of stuff I need to consider for sure. Um, so I hope you guys were able to take away something from the episode as well. I think baby sleep is so, so, so important. And like she said, it's not a one size fits all. So it's so important to trust your own gut and go with your own mama instincts when it comes to sleep and honestly, any aspect of babies and parenthood. Um, so thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. This episode was brought to you by Mommy Knows Best and Livy Mom. Mommy Knows Best is the creators of delicious lactation cookies designed to support breastfeeding moms on their journey, made with wholesome ingredients like oats, flaxseed, and bruised yeast. These cookies are a tasty way to boost milk supply and nourish both mom and baby. For our listeners, Mommy Knows Best is offering an exclusive discount. Use the code MOMTALKS at checkout for 15% off um, now through...
For our listeners, Mommy Knows Best is offering an exclusive discount. Use the code MOMTALKS at checkout for 15% off your order. That's MOMTALKS, M-O-M-T-A-L-K-S, for 15% off your order at mommyknowsbest.com. We also have our brand new Mom Fuel electrolyte drink, which I've been drinking this whole episode because it um, last night I didn't sleep too great, ironically, as we're talking about sleep. So this helps me keep helps keep me fueled throughout the day. It's loaded with natural vitamins and minerals. It's caffeine free. Get rid of those jitters. Today's episode is also sponsored by Levy, the creators of the innovative lactation products to help support breastfeeding moms. Levy's warming lactation massage pads help provide soothing relief and promote postpartum wellness by helping alleviate discomfort and enhance milk flow. Um, use the code MOMTALKS at checkout at for 10% off your purchase as mom talks, M O M T A L K S experience the comfort and benefits of Levy's warming lactation massage pads today and visit levymom.com to learn more and shop now. All right, guys, thank you for joining me for this episode. And I'm so excited for future episodes we have coming up. We've got a lot planned um, and I hope you guys are having an amazing spring. I'm trying to think when this episode comes out, which comes out in the spring. Thank you for tuning in this episode of Mom Talks. And don't forget to follow us on our socials at Mommy Knows Best and at Levy Mom to join the conversation and stay updated on future episodes. Remember, moms, you are strong, capable, and empowered. And until next time, take care and keep thriving in motherhood. Bye, guys. <laughs>